Well, good evening from London. Good to be back in our capital city. Welcome to Piers Morgan Uncensored. There can be no meaningful and lasting peace in Israel without a two-state solution. That is surely a fundamental fact. It means both sides of this intractable conflict recognise another's right to exist. It means that Palestinians have the same rights as Israelis, enshrined in law. It douses the flames of burning resentment which rage across the Middle East and so much of the Muslim world. And in doing so, it would ultimately make Israel a safer place. But Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has abandoned all pretense of a two-state solution. With increasingly incendiary rhetoric, he's made it crystal clear that he sees only one state, from the river to the sea. I clarify that in any arrangement in the foreseeable future, with an accord or without an accord, the state of Israel must have security control over the entire territory west of the Jordan River. That's a necessary condition. It clashes with the principle of sovereignty. This weekend, Netanyahu doubled down again. President Biden spoke to him for the first time in a month, emerging optimistically from the phone call to say a two-state solution is still possible, even with Netanyahu in charge. But then Netanyahu responded by posting this. I will not compromise on full Israeli security control over all the territory west of Jordan, and this is contrary to a Palestinian state. And the hardliners in his own party are backing him to the hilt. They say that even discussing a Palestinian state is rewarding violence and putting a price on terror. But that is the textbook rhetoric of an occupying power, and it's precisely the dynamic that has radicalised Palestinians against Israel. There is no moral defence of Hamas, and no justification for its barbaric attack on October the 7th. I've made that repeatedly clear. But there's also no defence of calling Palestinians human animals, for claiming there are no innocent civilians in Gaza, or for saying the common goal of all Israelis is to erase Gaza from the face of the earth. All genuine comments made by supporters of Netanyahu since the war began. Netanyahu looks increasingly like he's clinging to power and pandering to the hardliners in his cabinet to keep his job. Former Israel, Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak today told Netanyahu in the name of God, go, warning that Israel will sink in the Gaza mud for years to come if he continues to lead the country. Protesters today stormed the Israeli parliament to demand Netanyahu's government does more to secure the return of their loved ones, still held captive by the very people he vowed to eradicate. Yes, Israel must defend itself. Every country has that right and a duty. He's right about that, but he must also recognise that the war cannot go on forever. Hamas is both a proponent and a product of oppression. Without freedom and rights, more radicalization will surely follow. One of Israel's most distinguished leaders once wrote that an open-ended, all-out war in Gaza would be hollow and self-defeating. The Hamas leaders would come out from their holes and declare victory among the ruins, he said. Who was it that wrote those words? Benjamin Netanyahu. Well, joining me first to discuss this is Israeli government spokesman, uh, Mark Regev. Mark Regev, good to see you uh, and a belated Happy New Year. We haven't spoken this year. A lot has happened since we last spoke. I have a simple Rick, question Rick. following Benjamin Netanyahu's rhetoric in the last few days, which is, what gives Israel the right to believe that it should exercise this kind of control over Palestinians' right to have their own state? The right of self-defence, the right of my country to live in security, the fact that we have to base peace on realities and not some sort of pipe dream. And the reality will always be, for the foreseeable future, that Israel lives in a tough neighborhood. And any peace understandings reached that don't take that into account and aren't built solidly on security and an infrastructure of security, no such peace can survive. Right, but, but is this open-ended then? Is this forever? Is Israel's position now a totally implacable, there will never be a two-state solution? Because Benjamin Netanyahu's words certainly suggest that. So you've seen and you know that over the last half decade, we've seen peace break out between Israel and uh, a, a series of Arab countries, the UAE, Bahrain, uh, Morocco. Uh, you've seen talk of a peace agreement with Saudi Arabia, which the Saudis, despite the current fighting, have still said is... is on the table. Now, we believe as Israel moves and is accepted more and more by the Arab world, and this is ultimately a very, very positive process, that that will also affect Palestinian opinion. And the sort of extremism that Hamas represents will be destroyed in this war, will be discredited, and that'll give room for moderates. And we want to see the Palestinians 
join the circle of peace, but a peace that is based on reality, not on pipe dreams. How many Hamas terrorists do you think you've killed? So there are a couple of hundred that we killed on our side of the border on that first terrible day of October 7th and in the, uh, the following days immediately after that massacre. Uh, we had to take them out, We those people who invaded our country and so forth. And since the operation in Gaza started, we think over 9,000 of Hamas's uh, military fighters there, armed terrorists, we've, we've taken out and, and killed. Right, so less than a quarter of Hamas's believed force of 36,000 or so, uh, depending well, on which numbers all, you believe. But I mean, it, my point being, but, the amount of devastation, both in terms of uh, human life that's been taken, including uh, civilian life of women and children, over 10,000 children, it's believed, may now have, have been killed. If you extrapolate this to, where, to the end of Hamas, which is what your mission statement is, to eradicate Hamas, these numbers are going to get to catastrophic levels and leave nothing left in Gaza, are they? I disagree. First of all, the numbers are Hamas numbers and, and have to be taken with a grain of salt. Hamas would have you believe that, you know, well, the so, overwhelming respect, majority Reagan, of people killed... With respect, so, so are your numbers. You don't know you've killed no. 9,000 Hamas terrorists. Can I tell you, when we've made a mistake with numbers, we've, we've corrected ourselves. Yeah, but you don't know you've past. killed 9,500, do you? You, you can't no, that possibly... No, that is, that, that, that is the intelligence information that we have. Uh, we think that's an accurate number. It could be more, it could be less, but that's... I mean, people are always asking us for our numbers. If we don't provide them, people say, what are you hiding? Well, how, ma how many... Uh, these okay, are the best you know, numbers you know, I can offer. Okay, but just to push you on that, if you can be that precise yeah, yeah. about the number of Hamas terrorists, you must also know how many civilians you've killed. So how many civilians so, do you believe so, you've killed? No, but it's, it's a little more complicated. If, if a, a Hamas a fighter is wearing civilian clothes, is he civilian? If he's a 17-year-old man with an AK-47, a 17-year-old boy, I should say, with an AK-47, is he a child or is he a combatant? In other words, Hamas plays with the numbers. They want you to believe that they're all children, they're all women. Uh, no, Israel does not target innocent civilians. Israel does not target Gaza's civilian population. We target Hamas. Now, have there been uh, 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 civilians caught up in the crossfire between the Israel Defense Forces and the Hamas terrorists? Of course they have. There hasn't been a, a war in history without, unfortunately, uh, 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 people being caught up in the crossfire without civilian casualties. But are we making in Israel an effort to avoid that? Of course we are. For us, every civilian death, that's a tragedy. But for Hamas, who deliberately uses Gaza civilians as human shields, it's not a tragedy, it's their strategy. They deliberately embed themselves under schools, under hospitals, in civilian neighbourhoods, right, even under this, UN okay, facilities. Let me, let me, how does this war end? You know, to only today, you had dozens of family members of the hostages held by Hamas, still well over 100 being held, storming into a finance committee meeting in, in the Knesset in Jerusalem, shouting, you won't sit here while they are dying there. So nearly half of those hostages have still not been uh, brought back. You've only killed, by your own figures, you've killed a quarter of Hamas terrorists, so three quarters are still there. Your mission statement is to eradicate Hamas. Um, the infrastructure of northern Gaza has been pretty much obliterated. Similar thing is now happening in the south. So again, I just ask you, what does, what does victory look like? How do you know when you've won this war? How does the world know? So in, in the northern part of the Gaza Strip, we've already destroyed Hamas's ability to organize, in, uh, uh, to operate in large scale military formations. We've destroyed their battalions. We've destroyed their brigades. You still have the odd squad or two that can cause problems, but as an organized military force, Hamas does not exist in the northern Gaza Strip. In the coming weeks, we will achieve the same uh, a victory in the center and the south. And then we'll move into a, a campaign of counterterrorism, of counterinsurgency, because ultimately Hamas will be defeated as a military machine and Gaza will be free of Hamas as a ruling power. Uh, and I've said this before, we simply cannot live next to this terror enclave, just as you wouldn't want to live next to some sort of ISIS caliphate on your border. We refuse to live next to this Hamas terror state on ours. Ehud Barak, who ran Israel, 
says, for around three months now, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has prevented discussion of the day after in the inner cabinet. This is unconscionable. The IDF cannot optimise the probability of winning when there is no defined political goal. In the absence of a realistic goal will end up mired in the Gaza quagmire, fighting simultaneously in Lebanon and in the West Bank, eroding the American backing, endangering the Abraham Accords and the peace agreements with Egypt and with Jordan. This kind of conduct drags Israel's security into the abyss. And he says this when uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu's approval ratings are languishing in the early 30s, which is similar to President Biden's in America and is believed to be the lowest number of any incumbent president who's ever had to run for re-election. So these are bad numbers. You now have former prime ministers of the country uh, demanding that Netanyahu resign. Um, I suppose the obvious question is, why hasn't he? I mean, is it, would it not be easier for everybody if he stepped aside now and let somebody new come in and try to guide this to a conclusion which can actually work? You know, it's interesting because I'm familiar with the polls that you cite and others. But the truth is as following. If you ask Israelis, do you support the war aims as articulated by the Israeli government, which is to have Hamas's military machine destroyed, to bring all the hostages home, and, and to destroy this, this Hamas-ruled enclave on our south, uh, to destroy their political rule, you get overwhelming support from left to right to center. 80, 90 percent of Israelis, I, I heard today the the leaders of the Israeli Labour Party, they, they propose no confidence in the government over economic issues, but they don't propose no confidence on the, the waging of the war and the war aims. On the contrary, Israeli society is united that Hamas must be destroyed as a political and military force. And you can understand why, because when Hamas crossed the border on October 7th and started killing us, they didn't ask us if we supported Netanyahu or we opposed him, if we're left or right, if we're religious or secular, if we supported judicial reform or opposed judicial reform. Hamas just killed everyone they found. And I think for Israelis, we have our passionate debates in this country, just as you have in Britain and people mm. have in democracies around the world. Of course, we have our passionate political debates. Uh, but ultimately, I think October 7th was a moment when Israelis understood you know, uh, uh, we have enemies and there are people, young soldiers now fighting in Gaza against Hamas. Some of them are left wing, some of them are right wing. There are different uh, political opinions, but we understand as a country, we have to get this done. Hamas must be destroyed. It must be removed from power. And we must do everything that we can to get the hostages home. You always get sent out, Mr Regev, to defend Israel. And you do so every time. And I give you credit for that. Uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, despite repeated requests from this programme to do another interview, I interviewed him in March, um, nothing, hasn't given a single interview to a non-American uh, television network. Is it not time that he answers some tough questions himself? Well, he's answering tough questions every week to the Israeli media, which you know is, is just as tough as the uh, British media or, or the American media. He's been doing these regular press conferences okay. and asking, answering journal, journal, journalist questions. But ultimately... I mean, he's, he's focused today on winning the war. And he's, I see him go in and out of war cabinet meetings. And that this is the big picture, because ultimately, it's important that people understand what Israel's doing and why we're doing it. No, I understand that, but, but he, has, he has given is, a number of... The most of important thing is to win. Yeah, but he's given the interview... The most important thing is to win. He's found time to give interviews to American media. I think he should give one to European media. I would just like to once again, so, given that you do come on every time that we ask you, and I give you credit again for doing that, if you could just pass on that request, and I think you should. I promise to pass on the request, sir. Thank you.